Alhamdulillah, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam. Alhamdulillah that Allah has gathered us on the blessed day of Jumu'ah, this blessed day of gathering. And Alhamdulillah that Allah has gathered us on the eve of the ascension of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The blessed night in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took his beloved into the presence. Alhamdulillah, we know that what preceded the Isra wa Mi'raj was the year of sadness. Innam al-usri yusra, innam al-usri yusra. With difficulty comes ease. The year of sadness was the year that our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost his beloved wife, our mother Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her and raise her rank. The one who was the first to believe in him and the one who comforted him and gave him solace from the very beginning. We also know it was the year that Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, passed from this world. And he was the one who gave sanctuary and refuge to the Prophet and the nascent community of believers. And so all of a sudden, the Prophet ﷺ had lost his inner refuge, his beloved wife, as well as his outer refuge, his uncle, who was protecting his community. And this meant that the community of believers was in an existential threat. In the tribal society of Arabia, your tribal protection was everything. And now they were vulnerable. And so the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if seeking protection. But far from welcoming him with open arms, they stoned and they chased him and willed from him harm. And when he was asked, he said about that time, that was the lowest point for me. And in that darkness upon darkness, that difficult experience that he was given, the Prophet ﷺ took refuge in an orchard and he prayed a famous prayer. And in that prayer, he said, oh Allah, I complain of my situation. I complain of my weakness and my inability and incapacity as my people reject and oppress me. But he وسلم, said, I complain of my weakness. He didn't complain about his situation to Allah. He complained of his own inability in that moment. And the crux of that prayer was this point where he said, but, if you are not displeased with me, then I have no complaint. His only concern in that moment was that this could potentially be a manifestation of divine displeasure. But if this is what Allah willed and desired for him, he had complete contentment. Do with me whatever you will, as long as you are not upset with me. Sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so he returned to Mecca, and this is where the blessed Isra wa Mi'raj occurred. And there are many narrations of this blessed event. The angel Gabriel came to him, and he was accompanied by Mikael and other angels. And they roused him from sleep, and in the narration they split his chest. And they purified his heart, and they poured in it from gold vessels. Gold vessels full of hikmah and iman. And the Prophet wasallam was taken to the Buraq. This steed whose name is light. Buraq is from the same word as lightning, barq. And it traveled at the speed of light. Every step was to the furthest horizon. And the Prophet wasallam traveled. He traveled in this world, but he also traveled vertically, horizontally and vertically, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was taken 
to the place of Jesus' birth, Bethlehem. And he was taken to the place, Mount Sinai, where where Allah spoke to Moses. And he saw Moses praying in his grave. And he was shown many things in the unseen. And what the Quran says about this blessed night, مَا زَاغَ الْبَصْرُ وَمَا تَغَى His vision did not swerve nor go astray. The Prophet ﷺ remained completely focused on Allah. He was traveling to Allah. And whatever was revealed to him was not going to distract him from his mission and his goal, which was getting to Allah and ultimately witnessing Allah. And it's amazing in narrations what was shown to him. There were things shown to him that attempted to entice him to swerve away from that ultimate vision. Such that we find in narrations that one thing he was shown on his journey was an old man who called to him, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad, come here. But he didn't look. He stayed focused on his goal. And Jibreel said to him, that old man was Iblis. And and he sought to lead you astray and your Ummah astray. From another of the manifestations of the unseen that was showed to the Prophet ﷺ, there was a woman that the narration says had bare arms and was decked out in every jewelry and finery. And see, she said, Ya Muhammad, look at me, come to me. The Prophet ﷺ would not look, but he kept his vision towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma zag al basru wa ma tara. Sayyidina Jibreel said, That woman was the dunya. And if you would have looked at her, most of your ummah would have inclined towards her after you. He was shown a number of manifestations, and at each one, ma, his, his vision did not swerve, nor did it go astray. Ma zag al basru wa ma tara. This is our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Focus on the supreme goal, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrived to the holy sanctuary of Jerusalem, he dismounted the burak and he entered into prayer. And he prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, completely focused on his creator. And as he was praying, a throng of individuals gathered behind him and started following him in prayer. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands followed him. But his focus was so intent upon Allah, his vision did not swerve, that he was not distracted by this great multitude around you. And after he had prayed, Sayyidina Jibril asked him, do you know who it is who has gathered behind you in prayer? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. He said, it is every messenger that, has, that Allah has ever sent who followed you in prayer. You are the Imam of the Mursaleen. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which one of us, if we were praying, and many thousand of people gathered behind us would not be distracted from their prayer, let alone if it was every prophet and messenger ever sent. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, ma zag al basru wa ma tara, focused on Allah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, we know from narration that Allah sent 124,000 prophets. All of them were in attendance to meet Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi and he met them in that blessed occasion. And then in narration, the Prophet ﷺ experienced 
the greatest thirst he has ever felt. And what do you think he thirsted for, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Even amidst all the prophets, even after all the, the things of the unseen, unseen were unveiled, he thirsted for his beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jibreel came and presented vessels to drink. And presented amongst them was wine. And presented amongst them was milk. The Prophet ﷺ chose the milk. And Sayyidina Jibreel said to him, you have chosen the fitra. And if you would have chosen the wine, your ummah would have gone astray. Subhanallah, that the Prophet ﷺ chose the, wine, chose the milk, which is full of immense symbols for us. First of all, the milk symbolizes the fitra because it is pure. It doesn't go through a process. It is as it is created by Allah. Milk also we know in our tradition symbolizes ma'rifah, experiential knowledge of Allah. And Allah created us because he loved to be known. And so the primordial state of the human being is a loving devotion to Allah which leads to knowledge of him. This is why he's an nabi an ummi. Because just like the child, the infant, doesn't get food from outside, but it's fed directly by its mother. The Prophet ﷺ did not need to learn through books and lectures and courses, but he was taught directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our beloved Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. That's why one of the scholars said, it's wrong to say that the Prophet couldn't read or write. That's not what ummi means. Ummi means he didn't need to read or write because he was taught directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where the ascension begins. Up until that point, that is the isra. That is the horizontal journey over the earth. But then the vertical journey into the divine presence through the seven heavens begins. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the entire time, He's not just thinking about himself, but he's thinking about you and me. And that's why he is modeling for us the journey through life horizontally, but also the spiritual journey to the divine presence. And he was shown many things in each heaven. The prophet, is, the prophet you know, occupying each heaven. There is much that could be said, but we must skip some uh, in such a short address such as this. But ultimately, the Prophet ﷺ passes through the seven heavens to Sidrat al Muntaha. This is the blessed tree, the low tree of the furthest boundary. This tree is a miraculous tree, which is essentially the outermost limit of the created order. This tree in narration, its leaves are so large that it could wrap up the entire ummah. That a rider could ride for months and years under the shade of one of its branches and not reach the end. And amongst the amazing narrations of its leaves are that they are crystalline and they change from sapphire to ruby to emerald. They're transforming every moment you look at them and golden moths alight upon them. So the Prophet ﷺ witnesses this. But even seeing all of this, he only yearned for Allah. He was not distracted. His vision did not swerve nor go astray. It is also said in this place, Sayyidina Jibreel revealed himself to the Prophet. Sayyidina Jibreel had been leading him this whole way. And at this point, he revealed himself to the Prophet ﷺ in his true nature. Tens of thousands of wings, majesty, beauty. He is the greatest of the angels. And it is said in narration that some angels are so great and so luminous that on Yom Al people will think it's a law at first until Allah reveals himself. And Sayyidina Jibreel is the greatest of them.
But even as the Prophet wasallam witnessed his beloved Sayyidina Jibreel in that state, ما زاغ البصر وما تغا. He willed to witness Allah alone. And so Sayyidina Jibreel said to the Prophet, this is the outmost limit of my maqam. I cannot go any further. I am the greatest of the angels, but this is the extent that an angel can go. You must go the rest of the way alone. And from amongst what our scholars say, this is the culmination of the creation of Adam, in fact. That we know when Allah created our father Adam, he commanded the angels to bow. He commanded the angels to bow, and the angel said, will you create one who will shed blood and so discord upon the earth? Earth, And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, A'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you know not. And this is the fact that angels bow to the human being, Sayyidina Adam. And this is the culmination of that because the Sayyid of the angels reached his limit. But the Sayyid of Bani Adam continued on. And the Quran speaks about this meeting of Sayyidina Muhammad with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Qaba qawsayni o adana the two bows lit distance or nearer. What was revealed was revealed. It is said that the Prophet ﷺ heard the writing of the pen upon the preserved tablet. And it is said that if you were to hear your own name being written on this tablet, you would die from ecstasy just to hear the writing of that pen on that tablet. But the Prophet ﷺ continued on into the Divine Presence. And it is the dominant opinion of our ulama that the Prophet ﷺ witnessed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, he is the leader of Bani Adam because even in that blessed state, even in that blessed state, he was concerned for you and me. Which one of us, if we were able to be with Allah, would ever come back? Which one of us, if we knew we could leave this dunya and we could be with Allah, and we could be embraced by his infinite mercy, would ever wish to return to this dunya? And so the greatest miracle that was to happen that night is that he returned from the presence to show us the light. And in that embrace, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam the salat. This prayer that we pray five times a day the exact movements and motions of the prayer that we make were gifted on that noble occasion. And the Prophet wasallam said, As-salat mi'raj al-mu'min. That the prayer is the ascension of the believer. أقول قول هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ورسائل المسلمين فاستغفروا Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, even though he entered alone into the divine presence, he carried the heart of his ummah. He carried every one of the believers, every one of his ummah in his heart into the divine presence. And he returned to earth and return to the tribulations that would follow and the difficulties that would follow, including 
the events of Uhud and the difficulties and the struggles and trials of tribulations of life only so that he could bring you and I the way to ascend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And this is what we celebrate when we celebrate the Isra wa Mi'raj. Alhamdulillah wa shukrulillah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us every aspect of how to be in this world. Everything he did was with remembrance. And this, for those of us that converted to Islam, when we embraced Islam, it was overwhelming, in fact, to learn the du'a for entering a room, and the du'a for leaving a room, and the du'a for waking up, and the du'a for sleeping, and eating, and finishing eating. But what was clear as we attempted to memorize these is that what the Prophet ﷺ was a way to remember Allah with every breath. Our whole deen is remembrance. Our whole deen is remembrance. And our whole deen is letting us know not to be led astray by the world, not to be distracted by buying and selling. But just as the Prophet ﷺ kept his focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow in his footsteps. Ma zagh al basru wa ma tagha. This is what he called to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasahbihi. Now, he called us ultimately to a way of remembrance. You could even say he called us to the art of remembrance. If we think of it like that, Islam is the art of remembrance. And each one of us is an artist. And I write poetry, and I enjoy it, and it's something that I love, and I was drawn to Islam, in fact, through the beautiful poetry of our tradition. And once I visited a sheikh of mine, and he said, it's a beautiful thing to write poetry. He said, but the most important thing is to make your life a poem for God. To make your life a work of art for God. You are a poet or you are an artist, each moment you make a mark. When you die, you step out of the painting and look at your art. On Yom Qiyamah, what we have is our life to present to Allah. That is our work of art. And of course, some of us who feel that some parts of our life are not beautiful to present to Allah, we rejoice in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghafoor. Innaka al-afu wa tuhib al-afu wa fu'afu anna. Indeed, you are the forgiver or the pardoner. You love to pardon, so pardon us. And Allah's pardoning is like one who erases the ugly mark on the artwork so that it becomes beautiful. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to write on the canvas of our souls the beautiful qualities of his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam such that we draw his characters and our qualities into our hearts and we truly become Muhammadan such that buying and selling and status and the fleeting things of this world do not cause our vision to swerve from our Creator. But we are in a state of remembrance. And one cannot remember unless one already knows. And that is also what we learn in the Quran, that all of us know Allah at the center of our being. <laughs> we all witnessed Allah in the world before this world. But not all of us are in contact with that spirit deep inside of us that remembers. And so what our beloved Prophet Sallallahu brought was the means and the method and the art of remembrance. 
so that we could be like him, sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, remembering Allah as if we are witnessing him, as he defined ihsan. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarahu fa'in lam takun tarahu innahu yarak. Worship Allah as if you are witnessing him. And if you are not witnessing him, he is witnessing you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his infinite blessings upon our master, Sayyidina Muhammad. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify the state of the ummah and make us truly Muhammadan outwardly and inwardly. And may we take the guidance and the nur and the tarbiyah of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that we can truly be a example for humankind of how to walk in the way of the prophets. Peace be upon them all. O oh Allah, we ask that you shower your mercy on all those who are in difficulty and in hardship and are suffering. Our brothers and sisters in Turkey and Syria, the Uyghur people in China, and every place that people are suffering. Muslims or non-Muslims, shower your mercy on them, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. Manifest your aid to them, Ya Arhamar Rahimeen. O oh Allah, barik lana fi rajab wa sha'aban wa baligna Ramadan. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad in nura kasari wa marida kajari wa jma'na bihi fi kulli atwari wa ala Ali wa sahbi ya nur. O oh Allah, we ask that you bless our teachers and our elders and our parents and our guides and make us a, an ummah truly, truly transformed by the prophetic way. Ameen. Ibadullah, inna Allah ya'mudu bil adli wa ihsan wa itadu al qurba wa yanhan al fahsha wal munkari wal bagi yaidhukum la allakum tadakkarun. Udhkur Allah lazim yudhkurkum. Washkuruhu yazidkum. Wastawfiruhu yawfirlukum. واتقوه يجلكم من أمركم مخرجا أقيم السلام